Throughout this audio tour, you'll be hearing the voices of the officers and crew who served on Papinito and other U.S. submarines during World War II. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii by air. President Roosevelt has just announced. President Franklin D. Roosevelt's address to Congress, December 8, 1941. Yesterday, December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The attack yesterday... Captain Edward L. Beach, naval historian, novelist, and veteran submariner. In response to the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, the United States began a massive submarine building program. The United States ship Pampanito was built in 1943 at the Portsmouth Navy Yard in New Hampshire. The role of U.S. submarines was to cut off the flow of raw materials to Japan. The submarine fleet was instrumental in the Allied victory in the Pacific far beyond its cost to the United States. Today, the Pampanito is being preserved as a memorial to the submarine service of the U.S. Navy, which we proudly call the Silent Service. Let's head below now to learn more about life aboard a wartime submarine. We knew that we would be going into the Pacific. We didn't know where our uh, war patrols would take us. Our survival rate was the least of uh, any group, Army, Navy, or Marine Corps, we had about 24% casualties on people that actually went on patrol. It smelled of oil. Diesel oil. All of your clothes, the whole ship smells like diesel fuel, wherever I was. They knew a submarine sailor by the smell. Submarines are tight quarters, and we all live together. And I slept in the after torpedo room, and if you couldn't get to sleep, the rocking, the movement of the boat would put you to sleep. And I had as my bedfellows a torpedo on one side and a torpedo above me. Torpedoman First Class Robert Bennett. We had two kinds of torpedoes, the steam torpedoes. They're very fast. The torpedoes you see here are steam torpedoes. They're called Mark 14s and had two speed settings, 31 and 46 knots. The others were what they call Mark 18s. They were electric. The advantage to those was there wasn't any bubbles from the wake when they were running and they were quiet, but they were slow. The Mark 18's top speed was 29 knots. Look at the steel skids cradling the torpedoes on either side of this room. They were on what we call skids on a track. Bennett describes how torpedoes were loaded. Take some guys' bunks off them. Pull the skid out until it lined up with the tube, and that take about three guys to do that. Take a look at the four large bronze torpedo tubes. We had six tubes in the forward room and four tubes in the aft room. It was 24 torpedoes. Quartermaster Third Class Gordon Hopper. The torpedoes did not explode on a timer mechanism, but they had a what we call an impeller, a little propeller in the nose of the torpedo that had to make a certain number of revolutions before the torpedo would be armed. After the tube was loaded and the breech or inner door sealed, seawater was flooded into the tube until the pressure inside the tube equaled the sea pressure outside. You could vary the depth that they would run and also the angle they would assume after they came out of the tube. Compressed air was used to actually push the torpedo out of the tube, but the torpedo's own drive mechanism then took over to propel it on its way. When it left the tube, there was a big shot of air behind it, and there was a big thunk, you know. You could feel it all over the submarine. You knew that they fired. We'll work our way from here, the stern, forward to the bow, or front of the boat. Look to your left. This side of the boat is known as the port side, the right side is called the starboard side. Just before you leave this compartment, to your left, one of the four heads, or toilets, for the crew of up to 85 men. Sometimes you have to wait. That's all there is to it. 
You're looking at the propulsion control stand. In the maneuvering room. Well, that's where they control the engine speed and the load on the engine. This is where speed changes and direction changes of the propellers take place. These levers were used to switch the electricity from the submarine's generators to charge the batteries or to power the main propulsion motors. The submarine's electric motors drove the twin propellers. Electrician's mate O.D. Hawkins. You have uh, two men that are on the main control cubicle, a port operator and a starboard operator. The signal comes from the bridge on speeds like one-third forward, one-third reverse, charge the batteries. So we had control of the speed of the engines, how the uh, electricity was taken from the generators either to the batteries or to the main motors. The submarine was always operated by electrical power. The diesel engine generators powered the motors when the sub was on the surface. It ran on storage battery power when it was submerged. Being a uh, battery-powered submarine, diesel battery, we had to surface every night and charge batteries. The fastest the boat could go submerged was about nine knots, but this would drain the batteries in less than an hour. At slower speeds, she could go farther. Look to your left. Behind the narrow door is the tiny office for the electrical officer. On either side of this room are two of the submarine's four main engines. When she was running on the surface, Pampanito's maximum speed was 21 knots, or about 24 miles per hour. And when the engines were running, this room was one of the loudest places on the submarine. Submarines are noisy. The noise level at that time was so high, you basically couldn't hear anybody talk. We did everything by signals, everything. The only time the noise stopped is when the engines were shut down. This had to happen in order for the submarine to dive. The engines we had was probably the best submarine engine anybody could ever build. Motor machinist Chester Bienkowski. Fairbanks Morse, 38 D8 and 8. They were 10 cylinder. A post piston, we had two crankshafts, one on the upper crank and one on the lower crank, naturally. And the pistons would come together and the pressure of the air being trapped in it generated so much heat that it ignited the diesel fuel. At times, that heat also circulated throughout the submarine. I used to absolutely detest going down on a dive after we'd been running on the surface for six or eight hours with all four main engines online. Radar technician George Moffat. Because by then, the boat was hot, the engines were hot, and with no ventilation, guess where all that engine heat came throughout all the rest of the boat, and it would get hot. Look toward the middle of the room. You'll see a ladder leading up to a deck access hatch. Just forward of this is another round opening. This is one of the hull valves that supplied the boat's air via the main induction. The main induction is a monstrous hole way up front of the ship at the bridge that drew in air through a 36-inch valve. Just before you exit this compartment, look to your right at the space behind the starboard engine. There's a narrow walkway there. Ship's cook, Joe Eichner. And we stowed food, canned food, outboard of the engines in the engine room. This is the forward engine room. It housed the other two main diesel engines. Chester Bienkowski. In the engine room, I was an oiler. An oiler is a guy that does all the paperwork, takes all the readings on the engines, checks all the machinery in the oil, runs the purifiers, makes water. Look against the wall at the far end of the room. You'll see two stainless steel barrel-shaped objects, the evaporators. The sub's fresh water had to be made by distilling seawater. Generally, you made the water when you was on the surface only. The number one priority for water aboard the boat was always the battery. If there was any left over, we had it for cooking and coffee, and then probably lowest on the list was shower. We couldn't bathe very often. Water was at a premium. 
showers were not frequent. It must have been like 10 days to two weeks. We took no baths, you know. You used a minimum of water. No bath. You could get a pail of water, cold water. The only people on board that bathed more frequently were the uh, motor machinists. Not according to motor machinist Chester Binkowski. You didn't shower all the time. The cooks and bakers, yes, they showered all the time. If we had the water. At times we would shower and the water comes out of the air conditioner. We all smell, we'll smell each other. The crew's washroom and shower. When we first would depart from port, we would uh, have food stashed all over, and it wasn't unusual to have some in the showers. Let's move on. Directly below this deck was one of the ship's two main storage batteries. This level is the main enlisted men's berthing area. There are 36 bunks in this room. We had hot bunks. We had more men than we had bunks. We had two bunks for every three men. I mean, the third man was always on watch. Look between the bunks for the small square lockers built into the walls. Not a lot of storage space for two months at sea. Sailors would unzip their mattress covers and stow their Navy uniforms inside. They didn't use them much on patrol. Typically, you wore a T-shirt, shorts, and sandals. It was usually hot aboard the boat. So you dress lightly, and that was it. At any time of day, you could find men in here sleeping, reading, or writing letters in their bunks. O.D. Hawkins. Monday, October the 16th, 1944. My dearest Muriel, well, honey, as you can tell by my return address, I finally gotten on a sub after all of these months, so you can probably imagine how thrilled I was. Well, hon, I came home to find two letters from you, and I shall sort of answer them both. Mainly, I guess, because I'm not full of any... If you shouldn't hear from me for a month or so at a time, which is possible, don't worry about it. I like to think no news is good news. His envelopes all have a censored marking on them, so he was very careful of what he had to say. The expression used during that time was uh, loose lips uh, sink ships. <laughs> Look up at the forward end of the room for the ship's medical locker. It has a red cross on it. Pampanito carried no doctor. The pharmacist's mate took care of the crew's health. My name is Joseph Eichner, and I was one of the cooks aboard the submarine. I worked from, uh, let's say, from 5.30 in the morning till uh, 6.30 at night. Well into the night, the baker, he would bake uh, all cakes and cookies and rolls and that sort of thing. They say a submarino ate better than anybody in the Navy. Just forward of the tables is the galley or kitchen. <laughs> this is where all the food was prepared. Breakfast is uh, French toast or fried eggs and bacon or sausages. And then noon meal, we'd have pork chops or ham or uh, chicken or steak. We usually had French fries. And when you fed the whole crew, 85 men, you had to peel a lot of potatoes. The crew that was going to relieve the, the watch that was on ate first. And then when they finished, the crew that came off ate. 24 hours a day, we had coffee. Notice the checker and AC Ducey boards on the tables. The crew's mess was really the only recreational area on the boat for enlisted men. We had records that we played, records and, uh, and, and the radio. That, that's all you had. Blue Rain. I don't know how many times I played that song. Blue Rain. Falling down on my window pane. We showed movies, and we'd only have a few movies, and we'd probably show them quite a few times. And cards, play cards. Hello, you fighting off into the Pacific? Oh, I remember listening to Tokyo Rose, yes. With a grain of salt? Well, she was uh, telling us submarine sailors that uh, so-and-so was sunk, and we're going to be getting you, you know. You'd listen to anything that you could to get news, I mean, of how the war was going. 
find the grate between the dining tables. We only had a small ice box and a small uh, refrigerator. It was underneath, there was a, a trap door there, and you had the freezer in there too. Let's move on. Just before you pass through the doorway that exits this room, take a look into the galley. If you stood right outside of the galley and the storage room was right underneath it, below the deck, the shelves were full and the whole well was full, all the way up to the top. the radio room, the top secret coding machine, the ECM Mark II. It was used to encode and decode messages. Radar officer William Bruckert. There's always a radio man on watch in the radio shack. Anytime we had a contact or had sunk a ship, we would report by radio. Otherwise, you just sat there and listened and copied everything. The red lights are for the benefit of those who have to stand night lookout watches so that your night vision wouldn't be interrupted. Find the panel of red and green lights on the port side of the room. This is the hull opening indicator panel, nicknamed the Christmas tree. Oh, the Christmas tree was very important. The green lights would come on when everything was in its proper position. You had to have all green lights, of course, when you submerged. Rig ship for dive. Ship rig for dive, green board. To dive the submarine, vents were opened in the top of the ballast tanks. This allowed air to escape and seawater to enter through the flood ports in the bottom of the tanks. As the tanks flooded, the boat submerged. Look at the large white wheels to the left of the Christmas tree. The planesmen sat here during dives and when the boat was submerged. The bow planes and the stern planes control the depth of the submarine when it's underwater. Above the wheels are dials and gauges. There were angle indicators on the, on the plane controls and there was a depth uh, indicator that told you what would happen uh, when you would dive. If it was a normal dive, nothing uh, slid around. It would generally be about a 12, 15 degree angle down. If it was not normal, things slid around. 450 feet was the maximum they wanted us to go. We went significantly deeper than that. To surface, the ballast tank vents were shut. Then compressed air was blown into the tanks from storage banks, forcing the water in them back out the flood ports. As the tanks filled with air, the submarine rose to the surface. Find the ladder in the middle of the room leading up to an open hatch. This goes to the conning tower. You can see the pump room through the grating in the floor by the ladder. Look around the room if you'd like. Alarms were an everyday part of life aboard. The collision alarm meant a collision was imminent. The general alarm was the call to battle stations. But the most important alarm was the dive alarm. Whenever there was an occasion to call for the ship to dive, the officer of the deck would sound the diving alarm and yell, clear the bridge and dive, dive. Clear the bridge, dive, dive. You didn't go down soft and easy, you went down fast. The three lookouts and the officer of the deck had to get from your perch up on the bridge down to the ladder that goes to the conning tower, down the ladder to the control room within 30 seconds. We tried to get the periscope depth, which would be 60 feet, in 30 seconds. The conning tower was the control center for navigation and battle. From here, enemy targets were tracked and sunk. The SJ radar was located in the conning tower. The sonar equipment controls are up in the conning the tower. The torpedo data computer, the two periscopes. The uh, steering wheel at the helm. Sometimes the area is referred to as officer's country. The ship's office. I'm Charlie McGuire, first class and chief yeoman. Chief yeoman is the ship's clerk. See, I knew everybody aboard. The yeoman probably knew more than the officers did. 
The yeoman typed everything that went out of that ship, and he read all the official mail that came in. I was quite a typist. Uh, it's a very good rate, yeoman. Step forward into the hallway. This area housed eight officers, plus the executive and commanding officers. Just ahead are their staterooms. Radar officer Richard Sherlock. The big thing was developing, I think, a sense of confidence among the crew that you were competent as an officer. On your right, you'll see commanding officer Pete Summers' stateroom. The CO had a writing desk, deep depth gauge, and a repeater compass so he could track the sub's course at all times. Further along on the left is the wardroom, where officers ate, met, and passed the little free time they had. Richard Sherlock. I don't remember there being a crossword between the officers. Uh, most of us back and forth used our first names. I'm sure the crew had nicknames for all of us that they didn't use in our presence. My name is George Ingram. They call me the kid, the good kid. At the far end on the left is a small pantry for the steward's mate. As a steward mate, you served the officer's food. You really had to know how to set the table. The officers ate the same food that the men ate. The steward would come in and uh, take what he needed for the officers and bring it up there. They all ate the same food, except you could give them a little special. I would cook some bacon and dice some eggs and make my own thousand island dressing. On either side of door are steel posts. These allowed the sonar heads to be lowered down below the hull into the water for submerged listening. Step into the room. The sonarman would be the first to hear an approaching enemy ship. We were severely depth charged, you know, in the one patrol. We had a sound operator, and he had his headset on, and he could listen. You could hear ships like 30,000 yards away or so. And he'd say they're pinging on us. In other words, they were sending a sound. When they'd ping, the sonar would come down and bounce off. When they bounce it off you, they know you're there. This guy would be speaking on the phone, you know. They're pinging on us, they're making a run. And then you could hear the big propellers of that ship above, you know. The boat would be rigged for what they call silent running. Everything was turned off that could be turned off. You had no air conditioning, uh, fans, or anything like that. The humidity would immediately go over 100%. The perspiration just ran off. I've ever been really frightened. If they're going to get you, they're going to get you. They dropped, I think, five depth charges, which were extremely close. The sound was indescribable. It was so loud. You heard a real thump. I mean, a real thump. What a hell of a clank. The uh, light bulbs shattered. Uh, the cork that the boat was lined with flew off the walls. Darn near got us. That old statement about there not being uh, atheists in foxholes, it's true there aren't any atheists under depth charge either. You pray. Everybody has a maker. You pray to Look up. The large hatch overhead, in the center of the compartment, is the escape trunk. It was designed to permit the crew to escape if the submarine were disabled in shallow water. You've probably concluded by now that it was tight quarters aboard a submarine. Now try to imagine this boat with 73 extra men. That's how many British and Australian prisoners of war Pampanito rescued from the South China Sea in September 1944. Pampanito had been part of a submarine wolf pack that had attacked a Japanese convoy and sunk several ships. Unbeknownst to the submarines, the ships had been carrying Allied prisoners. We're now on the forward part of the submarine. Pampanito's guns, including the large wet mount gun to your left, were made to be submerged. Look up at the bridge. The periscope shears are the tall gray structures. On either side of them, surrounded by metal railings, are the lookout stands. When you're on the surface, you're out looking for whatever may be in any way a hazard to the ship. USS Threadfin Seaman, second class, Joe Seneft. In heavy seas, the lookout would have to brace his body against the steel rail 
that surrounds the lookout platform to keep from being washed overboard if it was really rough weather. Look at the broom on top of the periscope shears. The broom that you see at the top of the periscope shears was used to indicate to people in port that you had had a successful war patrol to clean sweep. Look out at the bay. Imagine gazing out over the open sea for hours on end. Gordon Hopper describes the first lookout sighting of the prisoners of war Pampanito rescued. We began seeing these men on uh, makeshift rafts. Boards and oil. And anything that would float, really. <laughs> we began to see them off in the distance. And the captain and the lookouts all thought that these were Japanese survivors from the ships that we had sunk. Two rafts with men on them. As we got up close to this closest raft, this big person stood up and started waving this large Australian hat and calling out, I still remember what he said, he says, oh, you bloody Yanks, one day you bloody well sink us, the next day you bloody well pick us up. You sink us and you save us, you bloody Yanks. Who are you? Prisoners of war, Australians, British, pick us up, please. Take them aboard. Look at the submarine's rounded hull. Make way, make way. It wasn't easy to get the survivors over it and up onto the deck. So there were about five or six of us who were among the better swimmers who uh, would swim out to the rafts with a line and pull them in and get these men off the rafts and onto the boat and down below cleaned up. They had been uh, in the water for four days. They were coated with uh, crude oil. Pampanito sped to Saipan, the nearest American base. Only one man was lost on the way. Let's move aft toward the gangway. When they got off the ship, they were grinning from ear to ear. They looked like 72 U.S. sailors going on shore leave. Most of us felt that was the highlight of our uh, time in the service, was being able to save these men. I wish to thank the officers and men of this sub for saving myself and fellow men from the deep. God bless them all. R.F. Granger. The Japanese have just officially laid down their arms. President Harry Truman announcing the Japanese surrender September 1st, 1945. They have signed terms of unconditional surrender. Four years ago, the thoughts and fears of the whole civilized world were centered on another piece of American soil, Pearl Harbor. The mighty threat to civilization which began there is now laid at rest. During World War II, Pampanito was credited with sinking six enemy ships. Captain Edward Beach. Submarines like the Pampanito played a critical and decisive role during World War II. They sank over 1,200 Japanese merchant ships and warships. More than half of all Japanese shipping destroyed in the war. When the rate of sinkings outpaced Japan's ability to build new ships, the outcome of the war was assured. But this success was not without its cost. 52 of our submarines never returned. Most of them disappeared without trace, their fate unknown. All but a few of their crews lie forever entombed on the ocean floor. 3,505 men and officers of the silent service gave their lives to the cause of victory. The Pampanito stands as one of a few proud memorials to these men still on patrol. On behalf of the Pampanito, thank you for joining me today. Thanks to the USS Pampanito volunteers, veterans, and others who made this tour possible. Naval Reserve USS Frank Cable, AS-40, Detachment N, Sacramento. Robert Bennett. William Bruckert. Joseph Eichner. O.D. Hawkins. Gordon Hopper. George Ingram. Charlie McGuire, George Moffat, Joe Seneft, Richard Sherlock, Ted Swain, Bob Taylor, and Chester Bienkowski. <laughs>